Hello and welcome to the Origins of Islam. Last time we've seen how the Proto-Quran, the first Quranic manuscripts, can be interpreted as Christian texts, as anti-Trinitarian Christian texts, but as Christian texts nonetheless, which were then later adapted into the Quran as we know it today, which is the Book of Islam. Now today we want to dive a bit deeper and we want to look at the influences on the Proto-Quran. Where did it get its materials from? And first, we definitely want to look at what the Quran says once again. So it was a special form of pre-Nicene Christianity. Pre-Nicene means before the Council of Nicaea, when the Trinitarian view was not yet fully established. And what can be found in the Quran is a Unitarian monotheism against the two nature teachings and against the Trinity. Jesus only had one nature and it was fully human, not divine. The Christology of the Proto-Quran was such that Jesus is the Messiah, he is the Savior, He's a prophet, he's God's messenger, but he's not literally the son of God. The Proto-Quran also contains a creation myth and an eschatology. Those are teachings about the end times. That's something we do not want to go into too much detail right now. Now, when you look at the picture on this slide, what you see is a page from the so-called Rabula Gospels. That is a book that was written in 586, and it is written in Aramaic. So that's the language which would have influenced the Quran the most. And... Books like these would have influenced the writers of the Quran, not this one specifically, because these Rapula Gospels, they were used by Trinitarian Christians, but similar books. Okay, so if we include his known titles, Jesus is the one person most often referred to in the Quran, for instance, as Messiah or as the son of Mary. Now, his name is not the name that appears most often in the Quran, that would be Moses, but as I just said, when we include all his known titles, then Jesus comes out ahead. In the Proto-Quran, Jesus is the son of Mary. That's an important title, just like in this anti-Trinitarian Syrian Christian tradition. So it is well attested to long before the Quran in this Aramaic-speaking region. Jesus is a prophet. He's God's messenger. He's the servant of God. He's the blessed one, the Messiah. He died, was resurrected, and he will return. And this Christology is what's typically referred to as dynamic monarchianism, sometimes also as adoptionism. The word Muhammad occurs four times in the Quran. Three times it refers to Jesus as the Blessed One. So it's not a name, but a title for Jesus. But once in Surah 33:40, it implies a real person who wasn't Jesus. So that would have been the prophet Muhammad. However, we now know that this is a later interpolation. David Powers wrote a book in 2009 called Muhammad is not the father of any of your men, wherein he had a look at specifically this passage in the oldest Quranic manuscripts that uh, exist today. And what he found was that they were physically altered. The text of this specific passage was written in a different way than the remaining text on the same page. It was a smaller script, tightly crammed together. It went over into the margins, whereas the rest of the page was neatly fit. So the only explanation is that a scribe removed what was previously there and added this verse, but this verse had more words in it, so he needed to write smaller and go into the margins. Which means that there is no Muhammad in the Proto-Quran. And once again, before we leave this slide, have a quick look at the image. This is also from a Christian lectionary. This time it's a bit later, so there is no direct connection to the Proto-Quran. The reason why I decided to put this picture on the slide here is because it gives you a feel for this Syrian Christianity, for the imagery of the Syrian Christianity, which is somewhat different from what we typically know as from Greece and the Latin realm. The Syrian Aramaic Christianity, it had its own, not only its own language, but also its own visual style and visual language. Okay, so now let's look at some of the titles for Jesus in the Quran, but also outside the Quran in the Islamic tradition. So Jesus was called Abdallah, the servant of God, Muhammad, the blessed one, or the one who is to be praised, Ali, the elevated one, Saliallah or Waliallah, God's representative, and both of those actually derive from Ali. He was called Al-Hadi, the Savior, Mardi, the Beloved Son, Harun, the Just One, Mansur, the Victorious One, Mahdi, the Redeemer, and Caliphat Allah or Kalfat Allah, the Speaker for God or also God's representative. 
a lot of those titles were then later reappropriated and either given to Muhammad or to other important figures in the Islamic narrative. But originally, they were all applied to Jesus. Once again, before we leave this slide, have a quick look at the picture. I mentioned before that Son of Mary was an important title for Jesus in the Aramaic Christian tradition, particularly the anti-Trinitarian tradition. And here we see Jesus and Mary depicted in a Muslim tradition. So that's now much later. And what I find interesting now is that this time the visual language looks a lot like that of the Zoroastrians. So here we can see how Zoroastrianism also influenced Islam, at least for now, in terms of visual depictions. And that leads us neatly to the influences on the Proto-Quran. So of course there are influences by various Christian groups. I'm going to skip this part for now because the entire presentation will be about these influences. So we will get to know them more as we move along. For now, I want to focus more on the somewhat more obscure or surprising influences. First of all, we have lots of Jewish influences, which in itself may not yet be very surprising. After all, Islam claims to be the religion of Abraham, which comes straight from Judaism, of course. What may be surprising is that we find a lot of references to Jewish apocrypha in the Quran. So we find, for example, elements from the Testament of Abraham, the Apocalypse of Abraham, and the Assumption of Moses, all three of which are Jewish apocalyptic texts of the first or second century. But apart from Jewish influences, we also find elements from the Corpus Hermeticum, which was a Gnostic slash Neoplatonist collection of texts written around the second or third century. We find elements from the Institutionis Divinae by Lactantius, who wrote a Christian apologetic text against paganism in the 4th century. And all five of these influences were identified by Geneviève Goubiot, who is doing a great job at going through all those old documents and finding these influences here. But apart from these two obvious influences so from Christianity and Judaism, we also find conceptions, patterns and terminology from a Persian religious tradition. So that's again Zoroastrianism. We've just seen how Zoroastrianism influenced the visual style of some of the artists who would later go on to produce Islamic art. But there is actually much more. And one of, the, one of those things is again related to the picture you can see on the slide here. So this is actually a Zoroastrian painting showing us the barrier between life and death. You can see how these unfortunate dead souls go into hell and are tortured by these devils there. Now, in the Quran, we find a concept called barsak. So, for example, in Surah 23, verses 99 to 100, that's a barrier between this world and the next. And a person who is in the barsak has not yet gone through the process of judgment. And this in-between area is a Zoroastrian concept. And indeed, even the word barsak is etymologically of Persian origin. Another Zoroastrian influence can be seen in the Holy Day of Islam in, fr in the Friday, which, unlike the Christian Sunday, is not related to the Jewish Sabbath. Because the Sabbath is the day of rest. And that is something that Muslims would have fought against. So they, they didn't think that God needed to rest. And indeed, that's what the Quran tells us in Surah 50, verse 38. It says, Indeed, we created the heavens and the earth and everything in between in six days, and we were not even touched with fatigue. So God doesn't get tired. He doesn't need to rest. And this is a clear attack against the Jews and the Christians who celebrate the Sabbath, either on Saturday or Sunday. Instead, for Muslims, Friday is a day of prayer and assembly. These attacks against Judaism and Christianity are previously attested to in Zoroastrianism. In Zoroastrianism, the creation also takes place over a time span of six periods. It doesn't specify days in Zoroastrianism, but it's six periods of time, like in the Bible. But again, no rest afterwards. And we do find old Zoroastrian polemics against the idea of the Sabbath and that God would have rested. Something that found its way into the Quran. But still, Zoroastrian influences probably don't sound too surprising. What will maybe surprise some is the fact that we also have Buddhist influences in the Quran. So what are the Buddhist parallels? Those are most obvious when looking at the laws and the rules regarding pilgrimage. And here on this picture, you can see a typical Muslim pilgrim in Mecca wearing his white garb. Now, what does the Quran say about pilgrimage? That is actually described in Surah 2, verses 197 to 203. 
but those verses are part of the so-called dark passages. When you pick up a Quran translation, these verses are filled with parentheses, which means that the translator had to add a lot of words to make sense of it. The reason is that these passages were later reinterpreted based on the established procedures of pilgrimage. When we take those passages out of those later traditions, then the Buddhist parallels become more apparent. But even outside the Quran, when we look at the Islamic traditions regarding pilgrimage, the parallels to Buddhist traditions are obvious. For example, when it comes to the clothing, there are strict rules for pilgrims. Ideally, one shoulder is uncovered. There's no covering of face or head, even for women who go on a pilgrimage. You're not supposed to wear shoes or socks. The clothing has to consist of two unconnected pieces of cloth and colors between yellow and red, so yellow, orange, red, they are forbidden. Now, this description alone already sounds very much like a Buddhist monk. And as we can see on the next picture here, these rules regarding clothing for Muslim pilgrims sound very much like the rules for Buddhist monks, with one notable exception, and that's the color. Buddhist monks typically wear exactly those colors which are prohibited in Islam. But that's only true for ordained monks. So laypersons, when they go on a pilgrimage, they also wear white, because they are not allowed to wear yellow, orange or red as we can see here on this picture. So these are Buddhists on pilgrimage and the lay persons all wear white. And what's more, as we can see here, before somebody's ordained as a Buddhist novice, they are also not allowed to wear those colors. So they also typically wear white. And the people on this picture here, they could also go on a pilgrimage to Mecca and they wouldn't look out of place. But there's more. Muslims on a pilgrimage have other rules on top of that. So they are not allowed to cut the hair, for example, and they're not allowed to kill insects, both of which, again, sounds very much like a Buddhist tradition, whereas it has no precedence in Islam. And because it doesn't have any precedence in Islam, the argument that it comes from Buddhism is all the more stronger. For example, the idea of not cutting one's hair doesn't really make sense in a Muslim context because there is no there are no rules regarding how long your hair is supposed to be, whereas a Buddhist monk typically has to shave his head. Only when he goes on a pilgrimage, he's not allowed to shave, and once the pilgrimage is done, he will shave his head again. Islam doesn't have this prerequisite of having a shaved head, so shaving your head at the end of a pilgrimage is a bit of a strange tradition if you don't see it in the context of Buddhism, where it derives from. And lastly, we want to look at some Gnostic influences. And the interesting bit here is that the Quran is actually full of Gnostic imagery. So apparently the writers of the Proto-Quran, they really liked Gnostic imagery. They didn't like Gnostic theology though, because there's nothing in the Quran. Which makes sense because the Christology of Gnostics was pretty much the opposite of that of the writers of the Proto-Quran. We've already established that the writers of the Proto-Quran were anti-Trinitarian Christians, so they believed that Jesus was just a man. The Gnostics typically believe that Jesus wasn't a man at all, he was only divine. So now let's look at some examples for Gnostic influences on the Quran. The first one is their creation myth. And what we have here on this picture is the creation of Adam. And around Adam are all the angels who bow down. In the far corner here, in the back, you can see a figure who's not bowing down. And that is Satan. And this is the origin story of Satan in the Quran. This origin story is different from that in Christianity and that in Judaism. But it's not without precedence. And indeed, this story is taken straight from the Gnostic Gospel of Bartholomew. But unlike the story in the Quran, the Gospel of Bartholomew also gives us more context. So it's the more elaborate story, which shows us that the writers of the Quran just took a Cliff Notes version, if you will, of the original, which was centuries older. And what the Gospel of Bartholomew tells us explicitly, unlike the Quran, is the reason why the angels and Satan were even asked to bow down before Adam. And that's because God created Adam in his own image, so they were supposed to worship the image of God. However, sometimes when copying the Gnostic imagery, the writers of the Quran bit off a bit more than they could chew. And here we have such an example. This is Surah 4, verse 157. And they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but another was made to resemble him to them. 
This is obviously talking about Jesus Christ and his crucifixion. And what Muslims today believe is that Jesus was not crucified, but somebody else was made to appear as Jesus and he was killed, not Jesus. And this is once again taken straight from Gnosticism. And the reason why I said that the writers of the Quran bit off a bit more than they could chew is that this is a decidedly docetic motif. Now, what is docetism? I already mentioned the Christology of the Gnostics. Docetism means that you believe Jesus to be fully divine. Now, because the Gnostics were docetists, they had a problem, and that was the crucifixion. Because it was well established among Christians by the time that Jesus was crucified and died on the cross. But for a docetist, that poses a problem, because you cannot kill God, so he couldn't die on the cross. But they also couldn't deny that there was a crucifixion, because it was so well established. So what they did instead is, they said, yes, there was a crucifixion, but it wasn't Jesus who was killed. It was somebody else, and in the Gnostic tradition, we even know who it was. It was Simon of Cyrene who carried the cross for Jesus. And there's plenty of attestations for that belief. So, for example, we know of a gospel of Basilides, the church father Irenaeus, he wrote a summary of what's in there, and he writes, He appeared then, so that's Jesus, he appeared then on earth as a man to the nations of these powers and wrought miracles. Wherefore he did not himself suffer death, but Simon, a certain man of Cyrene, being compelled, bore the cross in his stead, so that this latter being transfigured by him, that he might be thought to be Jesus was crucified through ignorance and error, while Jesus himself received the form of Simon and, standing by, laughed at them. And then in the 1940s, a great find was made in Egypt near Nakamadi, where a large cache of Gnostic texts was discovered. And in there, we also found a account which was written in this Gnostic tradition, where we can also read about this story. This is written in the first-person view of Jesus. Quote, For my death, which they think happened, happened to them in their error and blindness, since they nailed their man unto their death, for their annoyers did not see me, for they were deaf and blind. But in doing these things, they condemned themselves. Yes, they saw me, they punished me, it was another, their father who drank the gall and vinegar, it was not I. They struck me with the reed, it was another, Simon, who bore the cross on his shoulder, it was another upon whom they placed the crown of thorns. But I was rejoicing in the height over all the wealth of the archons and the offspring of their error, of their empty glory, and I was laughing at their ignorance. So we can see where this tradition that Jesus wasn't crucified comes from and how this actually poses a theological problem for the writers of the Quran, which they may not have been aware of specifically, but later exegetes then came up with this idea that Jesus is now still alive, but hidden somewhere between heaven and earth, and waiting to come back at the end of times. Something that is obviously no story anywhere in the Quran or in any previous text, but it was the only way they could make sense of the apparent discrepancy between this passage and other passages in the Quran. And one such passage is Surah 3, verses 54 to 55, where it says, And they planned, and Allah also planned, and Allah is the best of planners. And when Allah said, O Isa, I am going to terminate the period of your stay on earth, and cause you to ascend unto me, and purify you of those who disbelieve. So here the word translated as terminate typically implies death. So this is one of those verses that seem to contradict what we've just read, that Jesus wasn't crucified and didn't die. But that's not actually what I want to focus on right now. Instead, I want to focus on the word purify. Because once again, we're looking at a Gnostic concept here. Because in Gnosticism, the belief is that everything on this earth is tainted and bad, basically. Except for the soul, the human soul, which is a divine spark coming straight from God himself. And the goal is to reach Gnosis, and then upon your death, this divine spark will be released and can finally ascend back into heaven. Then it is purified. Death is the great purifier. In the Quran, when God says that Jesus' stay on earth will be terminated, implying death, and hence he will be purified, we can see a Gnostic influence here as well. But there's even more in this same verse. And that's the very last part, when it says, purify you of those who disbelieve. Now that sounds very much like a Zoroastrian concept. As I said at the beginning, the Quran is full of Gnostic imagery, but not so much of Gnostic theology, because for obvious reasons, this, the Gnostics believed the exact opposite to what the, the people writing this book believed in. 
Therefore, the writers of the Quran would not have liked this idea of death being the great purifier of your soul so that it can ascend into heaven because that is a decidedly Gnostic concept. So what they did is they still like the imagery and they want to keep it, but they needed another reason. So in order to take out the Gnostic bits here, they've introduced Zoroastrian beliefs. And for that, we have to go to another surah real quick. So in surah 9, 28, it reads, O you who have believed, indeed the polytheists are impure. So nowadays, when, when you read commentaries on the Quran, this is interpreted to mean spiritually impure. But originally, it was taken literally. And we know that, again, from the very earliest commentaries. So for instance, Ibn Abbas has written, Quote, the substance of the unbeliever is impure, and after one had contact with them, one has to perform a cleansing ritual. The substance of the unbeliever is physically impure, and this belief comes again straight from Zoroastrianism. In the Avesta, in Vendidat Fargard 538, it says, Such a wicked two-legged ruffian as an ungodly unbeliever robs the faithful man of his full possessions, of his food, of his clothing, of his wood, of his bed, of his vessels. By defiling them, he deprives the faithful of their use. So again, here we can see this belief that unbelievers are physically impure and whatever they touch is tainted and it needs to be cleansed, basically. So we can see that as well in Surah 355, where it says, Purify you of those who disbelieve. So instead of death being the great purifier, it's now God's cleansing ritual to purify Jesus from these unbelievers around him. So, what was the purpose of this proto-Quran? Why was it even written? So what we can say is that these earliest passages of the Quran are a commentary or an explanation of scripture. And scripture, for the people writing the Quran, would have been the Tanakh and the Gospel, or specifically for them it would have been the Peshitta and the Diatessalon. The Peshitta is the Aramaic translation of the Old Testament at that time. And the Diatessalon is a gospel, a single gospel written around 140 AD by Tatian, who was himself a pre-Nicene Syrian Christian and who took the four canonical gospels and wove a single narrative out of all four of them. So it's one single gospel based on the four canonical gospels. So next, Christoph Luxemburg also looked at the word Islam itself, and he says that when you interpret it as an Aramaic word, it literally means in accordance with. So that would be in accordance with the scripture. And the Quran explicitly says several times that it only wants to affirm scripture. For example, in Surah 5, verse 68, in Surah 4, verse 47, in Surah 4, verse 136, in 5, 66, and in 9, 111. And those come all from Medinan Surah. So those are all later Surahs. But even there, it still says that the Quran only wants to affirm Scripture. It's not Scripture itself. It's there to affirm Scripture. The fact that these are all Medinan surahs probably reflects theological discussions at this later time. The words Quran, Surah and Ayah, as well as the mysterious letters at the beginning of many surahs, strongly indicate a close relationship to Assyriac Christian traditions and the way it treated scripture in their liturgies. And a quick word about these mysterious letters. A lot of surahs start out with a few individual letters, which, going back to the first commentators on the Quran, nobody could make sense of. Even today, nobody really knows what those letters are, what they stand for. Now, Christoph Luxemburg, he has some good ideas. Again, it's very difficult to prove. But what he found is that we are looking, in many cases, at acronyms of doxologies. And in some cases, also at references to the Psalms. Those surahs then would be read in context of a psalm or would be preceded by a doxology, which would be indicated by these three letters, both of which is common in the Aramaic Christian liturgy. In later surahs, the Quran itself is now mentioned as an important book, for example, surah 3 verse 3 or 15 verse 1, but probably not as scripture yet. The word Quran is based on the Aramaic word keriana, which translates to lectionary. And the clue is in the name. The Quran was initially used as a lectionary. And what is a lectionary? A lectionary is a liturgical book with selected texts from the scriptures, not scripture itself. 
It contains texts, excerpts, commentaries that are supposed to be read during church service throughout the year. And that's why we have so many allusions to scripture in the Quran. And unless you are familiar with these scriptures, the Quran remains sealed to the reader. But the Quran also tells us directly. Now, once again, I'm reading Christoph Luxemburg's translations of a few verses, um, starting with Surah 12, verses 1 and 2. These are the written letters of the elucidated scripture. We have sent them down as an Arabic lectionary so that you may understand it. In Surah 3, verse 7, He it is who has sent down the book to you. A part of it are faithful writings from the canonical scripture itself. Another part are writings which are alike in meaning to these. So what we can see here, we are looking at a book that was written for an Arab audience so that they can make sense of the Aramaic scripture. So that you may understand it means this book, this lectionary, this you can understand, whereas you may have problems understanding the Peshitta or the Diatessaron, which are written in Aramaic. And in this second case, we also see that the authors differentiate between canonical scriptures and apocryphal scriptures, and that they use both for the Quran. Right? Because it says, a part of it are faithful writings from the canonical scripture itself, another part are writings which are alike in meaning to these. And alike in meaning, of course, according to their anti-Trinitarian beliefs and interpretations. And again, before we leave the slide, quickly I want to highlight this picture. What we can see here is the oldest existing copy of the four canonical Gospels written in Aramaic in a Syriac script. These Gospels were written around the year 400 AD. So this is also roughly the time when they were first introduced into this Aramaic-speaking region. Before that, the Diatessaron was, for the longest time, the only gospel out there for the Aramaic-speaking audience. And it took a while for the canonical gospels to take over. In the Roman Empire, the Diatessaron was eventually prohibited for being heretical. But further to the east, in the Persian Empire, among Christians there, the Diatessaron lasted much longer. And with that, we are at the end of today's presentation. I hope you liked it. Next time, we will have a closer look at the writers of the Proto-Quran. Who were they? Where did they live? What did they believe in? And until then, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.